Our final talk of the day uh, will be given by Dawakar Shukla from University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, another DTI awardee. And he'll speak about his project titled AI-enabled deep mutational scanning of interaction between SARS-CoV-2 spike protein S and human ACE receptor. Uh, so um, this is a work that uh, we have been doing for like, um, I would say from April uh, of last year. And there's some very interesting results um, that we have found. So uh, very excited about this work that C3.ai has funded. Uh, so, you know, all of you are worried about now about mutations, um, I guess, uh, on, the, on the coronavirus. And what I'm showing you uh, on this uh, picture is the, the English mutation, so-called English mutation, uh, the B117 uh, mutation. And if you look at it, there are a lot of mutations uh, in the coronavirus genome for this uh, mutant virus. Uh, but the spike protein, uh, which is shown in the red um, in this figure, sorry, uh, uh, which is shown in the red in this figure here, uh, which is shown here in the red is the spike protein. And what this is spike protein is, it's a trimer. There are three proteins here that you can see. There's a very nice rendering from New York Times uh, that I saw a few days ago. And then what you're seeing is this, this uh, cyan uh, image at the top. It's a human receptor. So when the virus actually enters your body, it binds to this receptor. And that's how it gets the viral, uh, virus gets an entry into your body, right? So if this interaction is manipulated, um, you know, uh, what happens is that the virus could be more infectious um, and it can have all sorts of, um, you know, complications could arise. Uh, so for example, uh, the mutation uh, that is uh, everybody is talking about these days is the N500N1Y, uh, which, is, uh, which is in the spike protein and that actually enhances the binding uh, between the spike of the virus and the receptor in our, in our lungs, right? Uh, so uh, what we want to do is we want to understand how these interactions uh, can be modeled, how these interactions could be learned and predicted. Uh, so uh, one interesting thing uh, that sort of came up when we are looking at um, uh, the ACE2 spike protein interactions um, is that if you look at this um, small fraction of the spike uh, protein that I showed you uh, from the virus, uh, it's actually is very variable. Uh, you know, it keeps on mutating uh, and it's not very conserved if you look at all the strains of the virus uh, that you, you find. Uh, and uh, what I'm showing you here is the, is the conservation of this strain uh, when it is bound, bound to the, the ACE2 uh, receptor in the lung, right? Uh, so the idea is that the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the challenging part here is that the virus can mutate to bind this receptor strongly and, and that could enhance its ability to infect people. Uh, but you know, we are thinking of we were thinking of it uh, in a in a slightly different way. Is that we can also engineer ACE2 um, receptor um, uh, uh, mimics to actually neutralize the virus. So if we can create a decoy um, protein uh, that you know it can be injected uh, in the body, and it can actually neutralize the uh, neutralize the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, so uh, that's something that we want to do, uh, and I'll. I will uh, show you how it could be done. Uh, you know, the, the way uh, typically people try to engineer these proteins is that you need to have an idea about the sequence function relationship, uh, which is basically saying, what is the sequence of the protein and what is the ability to carry out a desired function? Uh, and there are various approaches that can be used to learn these relationships. Uh, you know, one of the, obviously, as a theoretical way, uh, you can have a sequence-based models uh, where you are learning from all the sequence data that is available um, in literature, uh, and then you're trying to uh, use that as an input uh, and feed it into your computer, and you have uh, certain um, you know uh, types of models called POTS model that people learn to predict the effect of mutations on a protein. Uh, on the other hand, you can also do a, a high throughput experimentation, uh, which has become very popular recently, uh, where you can mutate all the amino acids in a protein to all other amino acids and then predict their uh, function. So the color here uh, uh, indicates, you know, this increase in a function. And this matrix is just all the mutants of uh, a particular protein, right? Uh, so, and then you can identify the hottest spots, like, uh, you know, which uh, modification in a protein would actually bind to the spike protein of the virus most strongly uh, and potentially neutralize it, right? 
so that's uh, that's very uh, interesting um, uh, way of you know building vaccines. Uh, and uh, so uh, what we did is was the first thing uh, that came to our mind was let's just use all the other different uh, sequence based or theoretical uh, predictors of uh, effect of mutations in proteins. So what I'm showing you are the three very popular um, three very popular uh, packages uh, that are used by people uh, to predict the effect of mutations. And as you can see that they are not doing very well. Uh, and the reason for that is, um, you know, there's not that much data to learn, uh, you know, these co-evolutionary um, relationships that exist or uh, the relationship between residues that existed during evolution. And that's what feeds into these models um, uh, to predict the effect of the, of the mutations. And, uh, 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 and it's difficult for them to, to learn, uh, you know, these uh, novel viruses, the effects of these novel virus mutations, right? Uh, so what we did, uh, we developed our own uh, sort of um, uh, variant effect predictor. Uh, we call it the TL mutation. The TL stands for transfer learning of mutations. Uh, we, are, we are using a lot of uh, deep mutational scanning data um, and the sequence data and synthesizing everything uh, to predict the effect of the mutations. Uh, uh, and this is comparison with the experimental data uh, that our collaborators have generated. You know, um, R squared is fine uh, or much better than the other predictors, uh, but the data, uh, the experimental data itself is also very noisy. So this R squared is actually should be much higher. Actually. Uh, so we were able to do this and I'll tell you how uh, very quickly. So this is what these mutational scans look like. Uh, uh, so it's basically saying where there is a, a blue spot that means that uh, if you mutate that site, uh, the binding uh, with the uh, virus will be stronger. If you go to the orange side um, of this uh, scale, uh, you'll see, uh, you'll find residues that if you change them, uh, if you make that change, you're going to find uh, uh, ACE2 receptor that is not favorably binding uh, to the virus, right? Uh, so this is a deep mutational scan data from uh, my collaborator, Eric Prako. Uh, he wrote this paper, uh, you know, in science uh, last year on this, uh, uh, using this data set and explaining uh, this uh, binding mechanism or viral entry mechanism. Uh, one of the key ideas uh, that came out uh, from this entire, um, you know, story uh, was uh, that, the, that the binding between these uh, lung uh, receptors in our lung and the virus spike is, is very suboptimal. And that basically is a very scary thought because that basically means that you can actually create uh, variants of this virus that could be very, very powerful in binding to the, uh, to the human lung and infecting us. Uh, so, uh, and we are seeing that now, you know, a few uh, months later, um, you know, we are we're actually seeing these variants emerging in South Africa um, and in England. So what, uh, uh, what we want to do is, uh, uh, we want to, as I said, want to design these new proteins that can neutralize um, coronavirus, uh, but also we want to make sure um, that if there are mutations in the virus, uh, uh, can we do, um, uh, how can we change our design to cope for that virus? And can that cycle be really fast, right? Uh, so this is uh, some experimental data that is that will help us to reach that goal. Um, and, and this goes back to you know, traditional transfer learning ideas uh, uh, where we are now using deep mutational scans uh, uh, as an input uh, to our model. Uh, and then we are training this, uh, these models on, this, uh, on these data sets. Uh, and then we use a sequence model and then we update its parameters to predict uh, the expression of these variants of, uh, of the human ACE2 receptor. And I'll not go into great details of the method. The work is already published. Uh, and I will skip this, but you know, one uh, uh, good thing, uh, I'll show you some results. Uh, we benchmarked this method on all the uh, experimental data sets that we could find. Uh, and there were 12 data sets uh, that I could find of different uh, proteins. Uh, and as you're seeing, what we did was uh, we took half of the data and we tried to predict the other half of the experimental data. Um, and what you're seeing on the right is a, a these blue things are the state-of-the-art um, methods that people were using, uh, and orange is our performance. So you know we are we are doing um, we are doing well. And as I mentioned, that these experimental data also has a lot of noise. Uh, so although 0.7 does not look too high, but it's a pretty good uh, number in the in this scenario, right? 
So we are able to do much better than other methods and that was very promising. Uh, uh, the other thing that we were able to do is that, you know, um, usually um, when you want to enhance, a, uh, let's say an interaction between two proteins or want to change any, any big functionality in a protein, you, you're not just going to have one mutation, you're going to have like multiple mutations. Uh, so uh, predicting the effect of the higher order mutations in, a, in let's say in virus or in the ACE2 receptor. Um, you know, that's always very tricky because the space is much larger. Uh, so for each residue, you have 20 choices. And then for the other residue that you're mutating, you have another 20 choices. So it becomes a very big combinatorial space to explore. So you need these, um, you know, AI based methods to actually uh, expand that that big, uh, you know, sequence of space. And we were able to show that even for the higher order mutations, uh, we were doing much better than the existing uh, existing methods. So that's the method. Uh, and then we basically designed a lot of uh, ACE2 double mutants, right? Uh, and, uh, and this was our methods. Uh, and we have this score that says how good the binding would be. Um, and then we took a cutoff for our scores. This was roughly 10,000 uh, mutations or mutants uh, that we found. And a lot of these mutants are on the interface between where these two proteins are interacting. Uh, but we are also surprised to find uh, that uh, a large number of these mutations are not at the interface, but they're away from the interface. So they are somehow these mutations are sort of dynamically, um, you know, allosterically connected to the interface and stabilizing that interaction, right? So this was a very interesting thought. Uh, uh, so on the left-hand side, you're seeing our scores and the cutoff that we use. On the right-hand side, uh, you're seeing the residue positions and uh, you know, uh, the first mutant is, uh, let's say, on the on the x-axis, and the second mutant is on the y-axis, and the green lines are showing uh, which residues are in contact with the RBD uh, domain. Okay, so we are finding a lot of mutations on the interface. That's the point. Um, and then you can also look at it in sequence. What kind of double mutants uh, appear? You know, one thing um, that sort of stood out from this plot. So on the x-axis, what you're seeing is the uh, the residue positions in the ACE2 protein, and the blue lines are showing uh, which dub, uh, are connecting the double mutations, right? And the and the green circles essentially are showing how common is that, uh, how likely are we to predict that mutation? So the good thing is that you're finding these hot spots with big green circles all along the sequence space, and uh, and these residues are potentially uh, very important for uh, interactions with the with the virus. And, uh, and you can uh, pick these sites and then we can do experiments uh, to validate how the binding uh, changes, right? And I've just, um, uh, you know, shown you the first hundred residues in a little bit more detail. Uh, and there are clearly four or five of these residues are very, very important uh, uh, that are sort of hubs. Uh, so you combine other uh, potential mutations with uh, one of these residues and you get a very powerful um, uh, design uh, for protein. Okay, so uh, this is very promising, uh, looked pretty good. Uh, and uh, as I said that uh, these mutations, if you put them on the structure, so this, uh, uh, this uh, magenta stuff is the virus protein and the green uh, protein is your uh, receptor in the human lungs. And you're seeing these residues uh, here these are away from the interface. And then you have some of these residues which are at the interface, right? And what you're seeing here are, uh, um, you know, uh, what you're seeing here uh, are all the residues in the ACE2 receptors. Uh, and the occurrence is the likelihood of them being in our double mutant design, right? So there are some residues which are very, very critical and big. Uh, and, uh, and this color here at the bottom is showing how likely are these residues mutated in nature, right? Uh, so if you are mutating, uh, if, you are, if you're trying to change a residue that is very dark red hair, that is this very, very conserved um, uh, site in all the viruses, uh, um, or sorry, in all the, all the ACE2 receptors, uh, then uh, it might change the stability of the protein. It might uh, unfold it and all sorts of things. So you don't want to touch things that are, uh, that are red on this color scale, but you want to mutate things that are blue uh, similarly, you also want to mutate things which are blue in terms of the color bar. So what this the, bar, the colors of the bar here are indicating 
is um, uh, how strongly this particular mutant, if you do a single mutation, how likely is that mutant to bind to the RBD or how strongly it can bind to the, to the spike protein, right? So these are very complicated plot, but you know we use these criteria for choosing our design. Uh, and then uh, these are some experiments from our collaborator, uh, Professor Eric Prakow. Um, and then you're, you're, what you are looking for are you, if you want to design these mutants of um, uh, ACE2 receptors, um, you want them to be uh, expressed very, very well. So darker green color means, you know, on the in the left hand side figure, actually means that there's a very good expression. Uh, we have uh, uh, what they have done is they have taken this protein and they have fused it with uh, with another protein that fluoresces. And depending upon the extent of the fluorescence, you can say how well it is expressed. So it's pretty good. We are introduced mutations uh, in this receptor, but still we are getting our, uh, it produced. So our body, you know, uh, the tissues are or the cells are able to produce this uh, particular variant of this protein. And then when you look at the binding affinity, uh, our mutants are actually much much better than the wild type. So the the gray line is the wild type, uh, and this axis on the y-axis is actually measuring the um, ability to bind to the virus, right? So we are seeing that these mutants that we're predicting from our uh, algorithms, they actually are able to bind uh, successfully. Uh, but what we want is, uh, you know, as you're seeing that this goes from uh, binding uh, from like a scale of 10, you're going to 50, so you're five times better. Uh, but what we actually want is a 1000 times better, right? Uh, so we have some initial uh, promises, Potentially, we need a triple or a quadruple mutant, as I'll show you, uh, that will have a much stronger binding. Uh, so we took these double mutants and we have now made some uh, interesting, uh, we found some interesting uh, variants. So this one variant, uh, which is a triple mutant, uh, N300Y, L79T, T27Y for the ACE2. Uh, this variant is actually has a 600 picomolar affinity, which is a very high affinity uh, for binding uh, to the coronavirus. Uh, and this could actually neutralize uh, coronavirus. But again, uh, you know, as we are continuing this study, uh, one uh, you know one positive thing that came out is uh, which people which we didn't realize earlier is that as the coronavirus is mutating, it may acquire the ability to um, to bind strongly to the human ACE2 receptor, uh, but it can also acquire affinity to bind to our DeGuay receptor more strongly. Right, so uh, in in a way, it's like the coronavirus itself is solving the problem for us. Uh, so what you're what you're seeing here is these blue uh, points here are basically the mutations that enhance the the coronavirus's ability to bind to the human wild type receptor, uh, whereas these purple points are the ones that actually enhance the its ability to bind to our designed receptor. Uh, right, uh, so uh, you know um, we are trying to enhance the affinity. But as coronavirus is mutating, it's also those mutations are also like playing a role uh, in enhancing its ability to bind to our designed design protein. Uh, so that's really uh, really exciting, uh, promising. So um, one uh, uh, interesting thing that we did, and this is with uh, you know a lot of computing power from Azure, and then folding at home, uh, which is a distributed computing uh, platform that um, I use along with a few other um, academics. Uh, so I don't want you to uh, spend too much time. This is a very complicated plot. Uh, TIC is a time independent components and stuff. And we did really, really long simulations. Uh, so this is roughly um, uh, three milliseconds of simulations of the uh, of these uh, two proteins, uh, which is a very, very long time scale for molecular dynamic simulations. So we did molecular dynamic simulations of these proteins. And the interesting point that I want to uh, mention here, uh, the question that I wanted to answer and this figure answers that, was that why our design receptors are are working better? You know that was a question uh, that always uh, bothers us whenever you're doing any type of design, right? Uh, so uh, the reason is very clear, um, uh, and I uh, what you can see here is that if you look at the wild type, which is the receptor in human body, uh, you know it is able to uh, you know find these four minimas in this plot. Let's just I'll try, I'm trying to keep it very simple for you. Um, so what this is, this is showing you is that these are the regions or uh, confirmations that the human ACE2 receptors can take. Uh, and once you introduce a triple mutant, what you see is that uh, some of these minimas completely disappear and a, a particular minima becomes really, really stable. 
And when you have a quadruple mutant, all other minimas disappear and you have just this one, uh, one minima. And so the idea here is what is happening is that the, as we are introducing these mutations uh, to design new receptors, uh, these receptors are basically engineering their interface with the virus to bind it more, um, uh, more effectively. So in a way, uh, you know, uh, what you're thinking is there are, let's say there are two things are interacting and they are fluctuating. But once we have introduced these uh, new mutations in this receptor, its fluctuations have become very limited and the structure that it adopts is, it has a very high propensity to bind to the, to the spike protein. Uh, so this becomes a design principle for us, right? And I'm coming to my uh, last slide or so. Um, and then now we have done the same thing for the coronavirus itself, the RBD domain of the coronavirus spike. And we can do this entire cycle and predict mutations that could potentially, uh, uh, you know, bind strongly to the, to the humans. And, you know, six months down the line, you might hear about this new mutant uh, that is spreading, uh, but you know we can now predict it using all this data and the tools that we have done. Um, and then I'll just stop. Um, so we have this now. We have this rapid design test cycle for any future mutations uh, that appear, uh, and we can potentially throw out a, a protein that can neutralize it. Um, and then I, in the end, I just want to thank my uh, graduate students in my lab who are funded through CT.ai, Matthew Chan and Shwen and me, um, and they have done all the all this wonderful work. And with that, you know, thank you to CC.ai uh, for supporting this work. Um, it's very okay. exciting.